Okay, good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker of today, Michael Blandabuski from Ben Gurion. And Michael will talk about LDP geometry of diffeomorphism groups, old and new results. Okay. So, um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's, it's a usual pleasure to be here. I already lost the count how many times I visited IMPA. It's probably the second time this year already. So, it's, uh, it's really great, mathematically and non-mathematically, honestly. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm going to talk about, so you, you see the title. What I'm going to do is the following. I will uh, present some, give some history, present some open questions, and then I will move towards some theorems and, and probably a part at least of the proof of the new theorem. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Mikhail Marcinkovsky and uh, Igor Shiluhin, who is here. So, uh, first I will talk about a little bit about invariant metrics. So, you all are aware about Hofer metric, of course, but there are several other invariant metrics on group of symplectic or other Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms or group of diffeomorphisms of smooth manifolds which preserve volume. So, some of them would be fragmentation norm, some of them would be entropy norm, or some of them would be autonomous norm, and so on. Also, in uh, group theory, you have some very interesting bi-invariant norms. Some of them include no primitive norm or commutator norm, and they're related to several things. So, some of them to knot theory, some of them to dynamics, and so on. Uh, but here, what I would like to discuss is the following. So, maybe let me start with the following question. So, uh, how to understand div zero, usually ample. So, it's a vague question. So what is M? M for me is usually a compact Riemannian manifold. Usually you can think about the closed one even. So there is a volume form and this is the identity component. But I would like to understand it from the geometric group theory point of view. So you would like to put some interesting metric on this group. Either it will be bi-invariant or it will be right or left invariant. And then the question is, well, how big is the diameter of this group? If it's infinite, then which groups finitely generated can you embed inside but in a quasi-isometric way. But let me maybe start with the following question that I cannot answer because it seems to be quite difficult. So uh, take your favorite submanifold of M and take your diffeomorphism group of M as well, which embeds inside of this zero M wall or either the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, whatever, just extended by identity. And then suppose that both groups have kind of the same metric. What I mean, suppose that you have, in case of uh, symplectic geometry, Hofer metric on first group and Hofer metric on the second group. Or suppose that you have some other interesting metrics. So the question is, is this embedding a quasi-isometric embedding? So maybe, let me put maybe the, the, the first question. Suppose that you have a disk in dimension two. And suppose the disk embeds inside of some sigma g, this is your surface of genus g. And then, of course, you can look at hum of the disk, which embeds inside of hum of sigma g. This is probably the easiest case, easiest scenario of dimension two. And then put your favorite metric here and favorite metric here. You can put Hofer metric here or Hofer metric here. You can put entropy metric here or entropy metric here. You can put LP metric here or LP metric here. And the question is, is this embedding quasi-isometric? So it means whether the distances here are roughly preserved in this metric here. So I cannot really answer this question. But, but I will ask some other questions which probably will help us a little bit more to understand such question, okay? So just, uh, for example, if you will put Hofer metric here and Hofer metric here, the question seems to be extremely difficult because we even don't know whether we can embed inside in the quasi-isometric way a free group with a bi-invariant bi metric on this free group. So we don't know whether the distances will be preserved. Or for example, it's not always the case that such embeddings would be quasi-isometric. If you will think about other metrics that I will define later, for example, LP metrics, then in higher dimensions, if you will take div zero of, let's say, three-dimensional disk, then diameter in the LP metric is finite. However, you can embed it in some 
three-dimensional manifold whose pi one is non-trivial and infinite, and its LP diameter is infinite. So it means that this embedding doesn't have to be quasi-isometric in general, okay? So, uh, right, so now let me uh, put some setup and then a little bit of the, of the history. So one M is compact Riemannian manifold. And two, well, if it is symplectic, it doesn't have to be, but then hum M in this case is a subgroup of diff zero M vol which is a subgroup of homeo zero m mu. So the measure is just given by the volume form, okay? So just this is, this, this is the um, setup. And I will just give a brief definition of a norm of the group. Everybody knows, but still I would like to start from something. So um, definition, a norm. on a group G is a function, we call it maybe nu, from G to zero infinity, such that, well, nu of G equals to zero if and only if G is identity to nu of g minus one equals to nu of g. Three, we have triangle inequality. Nu of gh is less than equal than nu of g plus nu of h. So if you have the three conditions, this is a usual norm on the group, and then you can define, define a metric on your group with respect to this norm, and the metric will be, let me just write it down, d nu between G and H, it's new GH minus one. So you can check it's either left or right invariant depends from where we define it. GH minus one or G minus one H. So you can put it automatically right or binary. So this is how you usually define word metric just on, 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 on groups, right? So then there is another condition in general that we used to have in, in diffeomorphism groups because we'd like to discuss sometimes bi-invariant norms or, or bi-invariant geometry, it means that those norms would be conjugation invariant. G H G minus one equals to nu of H. And then in this case, the same metric will be just bi-invariant metric, okay? So then just history a little bit about uh, this. Uh, it's not that much related what I'm going to say afterwards, but I want to start first with bi-invariant metrics and then move to some interesting right-invariant metrics. This is the idea of the talk. So uh, some known results. So interesting thing is, if you have a group, then the question is, well, you can always define a very trivial norm, which is bi-invariant, give to every element one and give to identity zero. This is not an interesting norm. But the question is, if you have a group, does it admit a conjugation invariant norm, which is unbounded. So the diameter is an unbounded, and then you would like to study it from the geometric group theory point of view. You would like to ask the questions, which groups can you embed inside in the quasi-isometric way? So let me give you some, uh, some uh, known results in this case. So, no results. And then some open questions as well, results. So one, so let's start with S L N Z. So if N is greater than two, then this group is bounded. So it means that no unbounded conjugation invariant norms whatsoever. And the proof is quite easy in this case. This group admits bounded generation and in each group in bounded generation you can just write it as a product, I think, of at most 54 commutators or something like this, but using those facts, you just can prove it, okay? And also higher rank lattices, you usually would expect that, that those groups would be, would, be, would be bounded. And uh, if n equals to two, then it is unbounded. Well, 
Well, the reason is when n equals to 2, it's a roughly a free group, right? So there is a free group of index 6 inside. And then free group, of course, is bi-invariantly unbounded because it has a lot of quasi-morphisms and so on. Or you can also look at PSL2z as just a braid group on three strands divided by the center as well. And you can look at this group and you see easily that this group is also unbounded, OK? All right, so then let's move to diffeomorphism groups. So uh, again, MN is compact orientable. So here, um, A. So um, if N equals to 2, then diff 0 and vol. So this is just, right, the group of symplectic diffeomorphisms, the identity component, is unbounded. Well, of course, we know that, for example, Hofer norm is unbounded, and many other norms would be unbounded on, on, on this group if you take, take a surface. Now, if um, n is greater than 2, then what we know is the following, that diff 0 m vol is unbounded if by one of M contains undistorted element. I don't want to define it here, but roughly speaking, if this group is just infinite. If this is an infinite group, I'm lying a little bit, cheating, but very little, then, uh, then it means that it should contain undistorted element, and then this group would be unbounded. Contains undistorted. Right, um, where should I move? Maybe there. So we know, of course, that Ham M is unbounded. This is a result due to several people here as well in the audience. And then I will move to another group, which is diff. 0m, so it means that this is the identity component of the pheomorphism groups, but no condition on the volume preservation whatsoever. So here the result is, is quite interesting. So usually this group is bounded. So this is due to several people, Burago, Ivanov, and Polterovich, also Tsuboy, and some others. So I will write it like this, is bounded if n is not 2 or 4. And then there was a recent result by Bowden, Hansel, and Webb. There was a long-standing question that they showed, actually, what was very interesting, that div 0 of sigma g, this is a surface of positive genus, so here g is greater than 0. This group is unbounded. So what they've done, they constructed some quasimorphisms on a certain new version of the curve complex, and they show that this group is unbounded. If you take spheres or balls in every dimension, that this group is bounded. And in dimension four, there are certain manifolds which is still not known. So you see there's a very big difference whether for the volume preservation or not for volume preservation. So, yes? Yes. Is generally bounded, yes. Yes. Vol, yes. Which is unbounded. unbounded. Yes. So yes. So, so like uh, the, the easiest example, it would be take a group which is bounded, right? But it 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 has let's say Z inside cyclic group. So if cyclic group sits inside in the distorted way, right? So it means the group itself can be bounded, but Z itself it's unbounded completely. So so like there is no relation whatsoever because the metric on the group that sits inside is way bigger. So maybe, for example, maybe you can connect two elements in the bigger group with the short pass, but in the smaller group only with a very big pass, okay? 
that's 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 mainly the that's mainly the reason. All right. So open question that one of the open questions for, that we start uh, try to answer. But so take your favorite manifold with pi one, which is with trivial pi one, or we'd say with with finite pi one. For example, the easiest maybe would be diff zero s three vol. It is still not known whether this group is bounded or unbounded. Okay, so maybe the easiest example would be even take the three-dimensional ball and diffeomorphisms are identity near the boundary. Okay, so diff zero vol is it bounded or unbounded? So usually unboundedness prove is proved, at least in many ways, by constructing quasimorphisms on your group. And boundness in the other way, in many sense, it in many ways it is proved. Sometimes you can show that the well, usually those groups are perfect, so it means that there is a commutator length norm, and usually if it is bounded also, not all the time, but if it is bounded, that every conjugation invariant norm is also bounded on, on this group. Okay. All right. So now let me. Uh, so this is. These are some facts about bi-invariant geometry, and then in the beginning I presented this question asked, well, if you have hum of the disk inside of the hum of the surface. Can we say something if, if this embedding is quasi-isometric? So again, I cannot say anything with respect to any bi-invariant geometry that I know, at least that I dealt with. So now let me move, so let me remove this condition of conjugation invariance, and then let me move, let me discuss some interesting right invariant metrics on diffeomorphism groups, and let me discuss uh, similar questions. So questions so far about some kind of history or setup? Yes? No, it does not depend on the, uh, well, constants of the isometry will depend, but whether the embedding is quasi-isometric or not, it does not depend, okay? All right, so, uh, so basically let me really start my talk uh, maybe from now. All right, so uh, let me define, so for every P, I would like to define your LP metric on the group of diffeomorphisms of a smooth manifold, which preserves a volume form. Okay, so LP metric on diff zero M ball. So the origin of this definition, I think it comes from Arnold when he discussed L2 metrics and the reason is, or well, at least one of the reasons, they kind of related to hydrodynamics. And uh, but you can discuss all for every p. And let me just define them. So let p be a natural number. And uh, so let me call this group just G. So for the rest of the talk, either this group or the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of your manifold will be called a group will be called G. Okay. And HT will be some isotopy in G, T equals to 1 in G. And now I would like to define LP lengths of this isotopy. So here the isotopy H0 equals the identity. Okay. Equals to the integral from, before, from 0 to 1 dt. And then I take the integral over my manifold, ht dot of x in the power p. Here is the volume form. And here I take 
the power 1 divided by p. So this is a tangent vector, and this is just a Riemannian length. Okay? So you have a Riemannian manifold. You have a Riemannian length of the tangent vector. Just think what happens if p equals to 1. This is the, maybe the most interesting case for us. You will see later why. So what happens is what you do, you just average over lengths of all your passes, right? Because if p equals to 1 and you take your point x, this is exactly the length, Riemannian length of your pass h t x, and then you integrate over your manifold, right? Okay. And then, as usual, if you, if, if you have lengths of your pass, then, uh, well, so first you have to know that L p of h t multiplied by f equals to L p of h t. And the reason is it's just volume preservation, right? So if you wouldn't have volume preservation, so you can change coordinates, then this is not true. So then when you have this condition, then you can define the P metric between, let's say, two elements, H0 and H1, equals the infimum over the P lengths of isotopy HT. And HT here, this is the isotopy that connects H0 and H1. So it turns out that this is a right invariant metric. It's very easy to check. And uh, it is non-degenerate. So this is so a fact. So if you're bored, you can check it now. It's just maybe one line. dp is a right invariant metric on G. So uh, if you take the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, then just isotopies would be Hamiltonian isotopies. If you take the group of volume-preserving diffeomorphisms, then isotopy would be just volume-preserving isotopies. So on all those groups, you can define it. So uh, now I would like to ask the same questions and give you some partial answers finally. So now suppose that I have a standard embedding of the disk inside of some surface Let's say of positive genus. It's even true if its genus is zero, so you just embed the disk into sphere. But this is, was already known before our work with Yegor. This was actually our work, but from some time ago. So just for the simplicity now, let's, let's suppose that G is greater than or equal to one, okay? So what we do, we just embed the disk inside either torus or just hyperbolic surface. And then, well, you have a, uh, the ma induced map of hum of the disk. Let me also, okay, let me this map call i into hum of sigma g. And then, well, here I have my p metric, and here I also have my p metric. So the same question, is this map quasi-isometric. We don't know the answer for this question, but we have some evidence then we believe it should be. And then I will tell you, so this is, so one, is it quasi-isometric, QI. So second question is, well, which finitely generated groups can be embedded into one of those groups, but let me take gener generically this group, hum sigma g dp in a quasi-isometric way. So what do I mean by that? Well. This is a right invariant metric. Here you have finitely generated groups. So here you have just the word metric, which is also right invariant. So the question makes, uh, makes sense. So uh, why do I restrict to dimension two? Well, first, because more is known and it's easier. But the right answer would be it is known that the diameter of this group, when you take a disk, is infinite dimensional in dimension two. 
in dimension three or higher, this is the result due to Schneerman, the diameter is finite. So then I don't need, I, I don't need to ask such questions in higher dimensions because if you have here take, let's say, higher dimension manifold with infinite fundamental group, here the diameter would be infinite, here the diameter would be finite, so I don't, it makes no sense to ask such questions. Another reason to ask such question for dimension two, so uh, Schneerman, uh, Eliasberg and Ratio proved that this group with respect to the P metric is infinite whenever D is a disk or it has a positive genus. And then there was a question about the sphere for, for many years and it was settled by me and Igor Shaluchin in a quite complicated technical way. And now suppose that we would have known that this map is quasi-isometric, right? Then everything we do in the disk, we can answer the same questions here. So now what I would propose is somehow to, to deal in a unified way for all, for all surfaces for, for, for such questions. I mean, which groups can we embed inside here, either inside here in a quasi-isometric way? Okay. Yes? Oh, how this map works, so you just embed a disk inside, right? And you just extend. So you take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of the disk, Yes, yes, it is compactly supported. Yes, yes, it is compactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I, I should, I, I should have said. So if if my, thank you. If my manifold has a boundary, then it's always compactly supported. I mean, it's it's identity near the boundary. This is this is this is always there. Or, or if you want open, then we compactly supported. If you want, yes, I, I should have mentioned this before. All right. So uh, let me present our our theorem, and then I will try to discuss in the remaining time the proof of this theory. Um, here. So just to let you know the best known results at least so far, so there is a general question, well, which groups can you embed inside of the diffeomorphism group? This is an interesting question. And many people dealt with it, and I think so. The best result so far is just that any right angle Artian group can be embedded inside of, of such a group. And right angle Artian group is just, in some sense, the group, the, those are groups between abelian and between free groups. So there is a, some generators commute and some generators just don't commute. This is how they are defined. And uh, several people dealt with this question and then well, first it was Benaim and Gambado that many years ago proved that you can embed in this group, you can embed Zn inside. It means free abelian group of rank n. And then they proved also that you can embed F2 inside, free group on two generators. And then Crisp and Viest extend, and then not only embed, but you can embed inside in the quasi-isometric way. So embedding is the easy part, but which is not so easy, it's a quasi-isometric way. And then CRISP and VS extended it on the planar right angle art in groups. And then Kim and Coberda came and they, they, they proved that actually here you can embed any right angle art in group in a quasi-isometric way. So actually what we've done with, with one of the corollaries of our main theorem with, with Igor and with Michal is, is the following, that what we can do is that we can embed in a quasi-isometric way any right angle art in group here, after we compose it with I, it is also quasi-isometric embedding here. Which means, in other words, I will just write down this theorem, that if you will restrict this map to basically any right angle art in group, then this map will be a quasi-isometric embedding. So it doesn't follow anything about this map, but it just gives you certain evidence that maybe the answer is, is correct. So now let me just state uh, the right theorem. This is so this is one year ago from 22. Let sigma g be 
compact orientable surface. And uh, gamma a rag, right angle arcing group. Then there exists a quasi isometric embedding J from gamma to G with the LP metric. So again, G is either the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of your surface or either the group of, or either div zero, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and moreover, I restricted to J of gamma is QI as well. So I should say that the image of gamma lies in hum of the disk, because otherwise I could not state it, okay? So, and I would like to discuss uh, this theorem. So the idea of, of the proof of this theorem, this would be actually, so it's nice to state for the conference because this is some interesting result in our opinion. But the main theorem would be actually different. So the main idea here would be in somehow to try to use first time Schwarz-Milner lemma for uh, non-compact spaces. And I would like to discuss now uh, the idea of the proof of a theorem from which this theorem or this corollary, I would say, follows. And uh, this theorem uses compactification of the configuration space and, and interesting, in our opinion, use of, of milner schwarz lemma and some, some different metrics on, 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 on those spaces. Okay, so before I go to the details, are there any questions? All right. So idea of the proof. Okay. So first let me define Xn of sigma G. This is a configuration space of order tuple of points on sigma G, which means this is sigma g cross cross sigma g n times minus the diagonal. By the diagonal, I mean extended diagonal. So whenever two points are the same, they collide, they are part of the diagonal, okay? And it is known fact that pi one of xn of sigma g, this is a pure braid group of sigma g. Okay. So pure braid group, if you don't know what it is, it's something quite easy to explain. Just geometrically take sigma g cross 0, 1. So take just cylinder and take n different points on sigma g and then the z1 up to zn and take the loops or the passes that move in the cylinder from z1 to z1, z2 to z2, and zn to zn. And these passes cannot intersect and they move only upwards in the time direction. And then they take the homotopy type of the cylinder. Okay, so this is exactly the, uh, the elements of, of, of the pure braid group. Okay, and you can actually see this identification almost immediately here. Okay, so uh, now I want to define the following thing. I want, if, if I have my diffeomorphism in the group G, then I would, would like to define an element in Pn of sigma G, okay? So let F be in G, and then let me take, so here I probably should say some base point Z, because it's a fundamental group. And then let me take some X point in configuration space, 
xn of sigma g. So we will define uh, now an element gamma fx in xn, sorry, in the pure braid group of sigma g as follows. So it's defined as follows. So first you have your point z in your configuration space. Then you have your point x. So z equals to z1 up to zn, right? x equals to x1 up to xn. So what you do, you have a Riemannian metric here. So you choose just short geodesics between x1 to z, between z1 to x1, between z2 to x2, and so on. And this is, I would call it, as a geodesic pass. You can probably object and say, well, this is not always the pass in the configuration space. And you would be right, but it will not be only for measure zero of points. So excluding measure zero, this would be a pass in the configuration space. Then I will act on, I will just take some isotopy ft. So ft belongs to g. f0 is identity. f1 is my f. And then here I would act ft on x just point wise. So it would be ft x1, ft x2. So this is a pass in the configuration space. This is obvious. And this would be f of x. And then again, I will connect by the geodesic from f of x to z. So I will get like this a closed pass between z and z in the configuration space. And then I take its homotopy type. And its homotopy type is in lies in pi 1, which is pn of sigma g. Okay. So first, it does not depend on ft. Here I have to explain why. So if your genus is greater than equal than 2, then div 0 of sigma g it's pi 1 is 0. And because it's pi 1 is 0, then it's automatically homotopy type would not depend on ft. If g equals to 1, then we have to be a little bit more careful. So what we will do, we take the group of only of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms first. And then it's known that pi 1 of ham of the torus is also 0. And then what we proved several years ago also with Yegor, the embedding of ham inside of sim 0 of torus is quasi-isometric. So then it's enough to deal only with the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms in this case. OK? So then, well, I will get a homotopy type. And this is the braid that I get. OK, so this is the first part of the puzzle. And now, basically, I will present the main uh, technical theorem from which this theorem will follow. And I will discuss its proof. Theorem. This is me, Michal, and Igor. So it goes like this. There exists constants A and B in R such that, oh, sorry, which depend only on N and sigma g such that the integral over the configuration space of gamma fx in pn sigma g vol is less than equal than a multiplied by lp of ft plus b. OK, so let me explain what is written here. So this is an element in pure braid group. This is a finitely generated group. And this is a standard word norm in this finitely generated group. And here, for every element, I get a number. Then I integrate this number of the over the configuration space. I have to warn you that. It is important that f is a diffeomorphism and not a homeomorphism. 
because if it would be homeomorphism, it could happen for certain cases that this integral would explode. So th th this is an important part. And then what I'm trying to tell that first it does not explode. Moreover, for every p, it is large scale Lipschitz with respect to the p norm. So because of the Herder inequality, it is enough to prove only for L1, right? Because we know that L1 is less than equal than LP. So this statement is enough to prove for L1. So this is what I'm going to do. And then from this statement, the proof is of this lemma is, well, maybe not this theorem, maybe not immediate, straightforward, but, but it's, it's much more simpler than actually proving this, this result. So this is the main technical result. So the idea of, of proving this is uh, to compactify configuration space and then to use Milner-Schwarz lemma. Because you cannot use Milner-Schwarz lemma on not compact spaces directly. So just reminder what is a Milner-Schwarz lemma is basically saying that pi one of your compact manifold is quasi-isometric to your, to your manifold itself with any Riemannian metric. However, if your manifold, say it again? Un, but it's the same, you never, then you put the same metric on your manifold as well, right? You pull, you pull it down. You, yes, maybe, yes, sorry, you're right, yes. To the, to the universal cover, yes. So, um, but first example, if you would think about when it's wrong completely, just take R2 without zero. Right? So if you take R2 without zero, so then, uh, well, it's pi one is Z, but then of course Z is not quasi-isometric to the universal cover of it. Why? Just because you can take a pass around zero, which will be of very small lengths, but which will go around it as many times as you want. However, and this was the idea of Michal actually before that, he said, well, what metric should we take in order to take it in some way quasi-isometric? So if you will think about it, if you will divide actually for each point, so suppose now you circle it with, with certain radius, which doesn't differ, but if it differs, you can also, can, 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 yeah, you can also define it. So if you will divide this loop by the distance from the origin to the circle, then it becomes quasi-isometric. So which means that we should, when we think about non-compact spaces, we should think about some scaling property of your metric. And this is one of the ideas to, to, in order to make it work. Okay, so uh, uh, proof, I will write it here like this. So this is the idea of the proof. So first, compactification of t -f -k of xn of sigma g. And we use compactification due to Simha. So what we do is the following. So let me just describe it. So first your manifold sits in some Rd. So we embed it just in some d-dimensional space. So m sits inside of some Rd. So then xn of m lies inside of xn of rd. And then this lies inside of rd in the power n. And then what we would like to do, or what Sinha did, he embedded this space in some other nice space, which I will describe now. I will describe this map. And then, well, we'll restrict this embedding to here and then to here, and then we will take the closure. And it will turn out that the closure of the image of this map, first, it is compact, and moreover, the embedding of Xn of M inside of its closure, it's a homotopy equivalence. So it means that pi one of your non-compact manifold is the same as pi one of your compact manifold. And then this will allow us to use uh, Milner-Schwarz lemma. So let me uh, just discuss this uh, embedding. So it goes into what is called 
a n of r d, which is r d in the power n cross s n minus one. This is n minus one dimensional sphere and choose two. So this is a product of such spheres and choose two product and then cross zero infinity and choose three times. And uh, so this map we call uh, alpha n. And alpha n is a product of i cross pi i j, product of all i less than j, and product of s i j k, where, well, in this case, i is clear. So this is just embedding of this inside of this, right? So this is the first component. The second component is pi i j equals to x i minus x j divided by x i minus x j. And the third one, s i j k equals to x i minus x j. And well, here it's i less than j, and here it will be i less than j less than k divided by x i minus x k. So you have product of all those maps. This is what is called alpha n. And then you take the closure of alpha n of x and m. And the closure, it's a compact manifold. And moreover, this compact manifold, it's pi 1 is the same as pi 1 of x and m. So this is the compactification of configuration space. Any questions about this? And there are several compactification, but this is the one we use in order to, to, to prove our theorem. Actually, this compactification I think it's a different construction, actually. That's, yeah. Uh, it's just, but, but this is, the, I mean, this is an explicit construction. And the other construction is maybe more general, but, but it's not explicit. And we need explicit construction, and you will see now why, because we will take certain metrics, and we will have to compare between different metrics. And in order to do it, we will have just to compute something. And then we need all those, we will need all those maps. Um, how much time do I have? OK, I have another 12 minutes. Good. All right. So now let me discuss uh, several metrics on the closure of. So, x n m for me this is alpha n of x n m closure okay so this is the compactification of my space all right so now i would like to define a metric on x n of m. So I will pull this metric by alpha n from the metrics from here. Okay? So here I will take a standard Euclidean metric. Here I will have take a standard, I will call it also Euclidean metric on s n minus 1 choose n over 2. And here I will have a metric, you will see that it just will. So here you can take different metrics and put different smooth structures on zero infinity, but we will use something which comes from the exponential map. Why? We will just need, we'll need it from the proof. And, and if you will use another metric here, then, uh, then, then the proof will not work. So what I want to say is the following. Let look be um, the metric on um, a n r d given by the product of Euclidean metrics Euclidean metrics and I will call it G X on zero infinity (coughs) 
So this is just what is GX. This is a pullback of the standard metric from 0 0.1 by E in the power minus X, okay? So this is, uh, let me write it here. So GX is pullback by E in the power minus X of the standard metric on 0 0.1. And you take this product of Euclidean metric here, Euclidean metric here, and GX, and then you look at alpha n star of UK, and we call it Euclidean metric on the configuration space. This is our G on Xn of M. Okay? All right. So now let me define the second metric. So second metric, as I said, this was the idea due to Michal, in order for things to work for configuration spaces. So you need just some scaling. All right, so um, where do I want to write? Maybe there. So second metric. Let x1 up to xn, just the point in xn of Rd. And by dx, we'll define just the minimum of the distances xi minus xj whenever i is not equal to j. So exactly. The idea of R2 minus 0, this is exactly would be if this is a point 0 and this is x, y would be just some x here, okay? So, and then let G0 be a metric on um, x, n, r, d given by V of G0 equals just V. So this is the standard Riemannian metric on the tangent space divided by D of X. So maybe I should write it here at the point X, okay? So this is the scaling factor. So now I will present you several inequalities between those metrics and also will be able to apply Milner-Schwarz lemma for the first metric because our space now, configuration space, is compactified. So then we can use for the first Euclidean metric Milner Schwarz lemma. We know that uh, pi 1 of the configuration space is the same as pi 1 of its compactification. And then we'll also use some inequality between, this is just a computation, between the first metric and the second metric. And then there is a theorem which relates this metric to this LP metric. So I will write just this three steps in a minute. Um, where should I go? Maybe here. Okay. So lemma one. There exists C1 greater than zero such that Vg is less than equal than C1 Vg0. So it means that the Euclidean metric is bounded by this metric. And in order to prove it, it's just a computation, you will need actually this exponential map. So if you will take another metric, then it will not, just will not work. 
Okay. So this is the uh, first lemma, and the proof is not complicated. And second lemma. Uh, so this is one maybe. Second lemma. So this is a theorem due to Michal. He proved which we proved before, is that if you take this metric then it is already large-scale Lipschitz with respect to the LP metric. And this comes actually back to, again, Gambadoy and Ben Naim. It's just uh, extending in a very nice and intelligent way their results. Xn of sigma g of L g0 of isotopy ft is less than equal than some c2, so I should say, um, Maybe lemma two. lemma two. There exists C2 greater than zero. C2 L1 of Ft. And uh, the last part is uh, Milner Schwartz lemma, which we apply now to this metric G. And uh, Milner-Schwarz implies that there exists some constants A0 and B0 in R such that the lengths of gamma F, X, Pn, well, maybe I, I do like this, Pn sigma g is less than equal than A multiplied by Lg Ft plus B0. Okay? So again, why is this true here? So now we use compactification of the configuration space. This is the length of my loop in pi 1 which is quasi-isometric to the length of the isotopy that gives me this loop, OK? So I should probably write here maybe FTX. Yes, I should write everywhere FTX, of course. It's, uh, sorry. Yes, this, this is the right thing. Yeah, thank you. So this is just the length of this pass, right? The G length of this pass and the universal cover. So then if you combine all those three results, then you can immediately see the proof if you combine uh, star, two star, and three stars. The combination will give you the proof of the main theorem. And then, uh, how much time do I have? I have two minutes. So actually, going from here to go to there, it's not that, that much complicated. What you need to do is the following. Let me maybe describe it in one minute. What you do, you take in your diffeomorphism group is a nice subgroup, but you take the, the metric from the whole group. What do I mean by that? Just so we have this base point Z1, Z2, and Zn, right? So circle them with some disks, which do not intersect. And then take the group of diffeomorphisms, which preserve the volume and everything, which are identity on every point and such of those disks but then take the metric induced from the big group. So now, from this group, you will have a homomorphism to Pn of sigma g. What is the homomorphism? You take your diffeomorphism f. It preserves the point z. And then they just take any isotopy, isotopy in the big group between the identity and f, and take its trace. When you will take its trace, you will get exactly this, uh, this map. And this map is a homomorphism. Using this thing, one can show that this homomorphism is large-scale Lipschitz. And then using results of, of, of uh, Kim and Koberda, one can embed a rug. For any rug, there exists some n. So this rug embeds into Pn of sigma g. So then what will happen is that you have this embedding, which is quasi-isometric. You will have this embedding, which is large-scale Lipschitz. So then this is a nonsense lemma, which we call then automatically this embedding will be quasi-isometric. So this is the idea of this proof. And then one has to work a little bit harder, not so much, to show that everything factors through the disk. 
And then this gives uh, a proof of the second part. And just to note also for uh, experts maybe, so another thing which this theorem applies that all Gambadoji is quasimorphisms. It means that quasi, so if you have a quasimorphism on the braid group of your surface, then you can get a quasimorphism on your div zero area preserving or on your hump. All of them continuous in, are continuous in LP metric. The fact which was, not, was, which was known only for either Lao genus, which I mean genus zero, or n equals to one. So we didn't know this fact. And actually, it's interesting that all these quasimorphisms, this is due to Misha Kanevsky, they are not Lipschitz with respect to Hofer metrics. So the features are completely different. And I think this is, yeah, exactly time to stop. So thank you. <laughs>